So, thank you for the introduction. Um, yeah, as you can see, there is no Android in the title. Um, and so we're taking actually a little bit of broader perspective here. It's not just like for phones and so on, but it's for embedded devices, especially ones that are based on RISC processors. Uh, my name is Matthias Neugschwan. Oh, thank you for the introduction. And actually, I did the work together with Colin Moliner, who uh, would have had the slot today, but unfortunately, he couldn't come. Recently started a new job, and most of the work was actually done. Uh, we did together at Northeastern University. Okay, um, well, let's get started. As I said, it's a little bit of a broader perspective, and I'm going to talk about embedded devices, of which, of course, uh, the phone, not especially the smartphone, but like any phones are just one of them, right? And if you look at embedded devices, they're really interesting because they're produced in very large quantities. They're not actually a computer, but they are a computer in a sense. Uh, they are often based on low-cost, risk-based CPUs and produced in masses. Of course, there are exceptions as well. For example, CPUs for smartphones that have more features. And uh, so still, most of the devices run full-fledged operating systems, sometimes stripped down to certain degrees, some features removed, some features added, and so on. But for example, yeah, if you take a look at, of course, Android is Linux, and many smart TVs actually run Linux, and routers run derivatives of Linux. Um, why is it in, why are embedded devices interesting from uh, a security point of view? Because they are very valuable targets. They are always on. They contain interesting personal data, especially phones, right? And sometimes they control quite important things. And um, of course, they contain software vulnerabilities. So the software runs of them um, might be subject to memory corruption vulnerabilities, and so they are exploited like desktop and servers. However, the problem with embedded devices in general is that the mitigations on those devices are often, not always, but very often, not state of the art. So, um, native code, I'm really glad that we've heard uh, native code being mentioned before already. Uh, native code and memory corruption, uh, why do we talk about that? Well, yeah, we've heard Android, of course, the apps run Java, but it's definitely possible to run native code as well. And just in the talk before, we have been introduced to stage fright already. So even on Android, you can have sometimes native code running if developers run a more insecure app. Let's put it that way. Um, if you take a look at uh, state-of-the-art mitigations, um, the well-known ones, there is data execution prevention, which is really nice because uh, you can make memory pages non-executable, and this definitely hinders code ex injection. But again, this requires hardware support which only proper CPUs, so more the more higher end, for example, ARM and uh, MIPS devices do have. And uh, emulation exists, but it's usually slow. And um, they can also be bypassed to some extent uh, using code reuse techniques such as return to library or return oriented programming. Then uh, there's address-based layout randomization, which is uh, also state of the art. Uh, basically move uh, code to an unpredictable location in memory so that it can't be uh, exploited using code reuse. Um, this again can be bypassed, although it's hard, of course, uh, using information leaks and uh, so return oriented program works again. Then uh, we've already uh, also had uh, control flow integrity being mentioned in the talk before, which basically detects whether code blocks are executed out of order to mitigate code reuse attacks. Um, but in order to work efficiently, it either requires access to source code or and or compiler support and in other cases, it leads to really high overhead. Uh, then, again, from a very different angle, there's uh, system caller policy uh, enforcement. There are methods like uh, SLinux and App Armor or system call anomaly detection, but they require usually a per app configuration or to basically learn what the application is doing. Then, uh, again, there were some, uh, was some novel research that uh, uses hardware features that were not originally designed for security, but uh, can be used for this as well to, to patent security on devices. For example, the last branch record, um, CPU register that basically tracks the last branches uh, that can be used for co uh, to detect code reuse attacks. And there's also performance measurement counters. This can be used for the same uh, reason, but the problem with them again is that uh, they're x86 only usually they are not uh, present on, on risk and lower end devices. Okay, um, so our idea was, can we somehow leverage um, common hardware features of risk uh, for security? 
there are many risk flavors as ARM, this MIPS, SuperH, and so on, and they all follow a, yeah, as a, a same design, basically. And at the same time, we wanted to avoid a very, uh, a very specific functionality, to avoid using specific functionalities such as the last branch record um, of x86. And so when we look at those architecture features, there of risk, there's uh, risk uses register only operations, so you have this load store architecture, that you always load from memory into a register and save back from this again. Um, there's a couple of uh, specialized registers, and you have many registers, for example, uh, in control flow, we'll come to back to that later. You have fixed instruction length that makes it a little bit more easy to disassemble, whereas you have to uh, variable <laughs> instruction length on x86, and you usually have uh, enforcement of instruction or address alignment, so that you can't just jump into the middle of an instruction, which you would normally do with return oriented programming. So our goal was to bring uh, state-of-the-art mitigations uh, to embedded risk devices. We wanted to build a lightweight exploit mitigation uh, that is also suitable for more budget uh, systems, uh, that uses risk hardware features, and uh, that is, and that's the third feature that is tailored for binary only or common off-the-shelf uh, programs, basically, where you often don't have the source code available. So you're bound to using a certain library, and you only have the library in binary, but not the source code for it. Okay, um, taking a uh, sidestep, when we look at uh, the fundamentals of exploits, exploits use operating system functionality. So to read or write data or to launch a program they will, uh, or process, they will usually trap into the kernel and see that uh, they can perform the certain uh, functionality. And <clears throat> one in insight is that the operating system usage of an exploit usually differs from that of an original program. So either different system calls are used or they're used with different parameters. And uh, our idea was that the, if we can ensure that the runtime operating system usage is coherent with the operating usage, uh, with the OS usage in the binary executable that is stored on the disk, um, then we would definitely uh, get a security benefit out of that. So we wanted to make sure that uh, system calls that are being used are actually in, uh, also used by the executable that is stored on the disk, that system call argument matches, and that the call chain that leads up to the system calls, that they also match. And uh, we coined the whole thing uh, binary integrity or short bintegrity. Um, from a slightly different angle, if you look at this, so many people uh, that have been in the security field have definitely heard of all the system call monitors and so on and uh, policy-based solutions where you, where you lock down uh, what, what an application can do. But the problem with policy-based solutions is that uh, policies, first, they need to be defined, and then they need to be kept updated. If you do make them too wide, then uh, you, maybe an attacker can bypass them. If you make them too narrow, uh, maybe the app doesn't work correctly anymore. If you update the app, you, you add some more uh, new functionality, you might actually break the app and it doesn't run anymore. So uh, with Bintegrity, we have uh, the nice approach that the application binary is actually the policy. So the binary, the program itself, provides us with, with all the information about what it is doing. And um, yeah, the idea is that we track the program's runtime state and we always compare it with a state, basically, that we extract from the binary image. And if we have non-matching states, so if we see a uh, something diverge here, then uh, we can say, okay, an attack has happened. Um, what are the core features of Bintegrity? We provide something like uh, depth-like functionality. I don't exactly like, uh, s like to say that we just provide uh, data execution prevention because it's actually a little bit more that we do. So uh, what we do is we only execute code that is present on the binary on the disk. Um, there is some super lightweight CFI methods that we use. And we also provide uh, basically a system call filter uh, policy approach without actually having to specify a policy. And yeah, there's works on binaries, there's no uh, rewrite effort needed, there's no instrumentation effort needed, and also no extra configuration. If we take a uh, look at the threat model that we take into account, uh, what we assume is that uh, we have a trusted kernel so we protect uh, user space code, basically. 
um, we see, okay, we trust all the binaries that are stored on the disk because, of course, they are basically our ground truth. Our ground truth. And uh, we assume that the executables and libraries are not modified by an attacker. Uh, however, the memory, so basically the process runtime state is, uh, uh, and the memory that is used is untrusted because we would try to fight off memory corruption attacks. So, um, an overview of, of how the system works. If we set out with a binary executable that is stored on a disk and it's been launched, then we end up with a runtime process image that has all the memory and registers and so on associated with it. And at some point, uh, because it wants to do something, the process will issue a system call and request a service from the operating system. So that's where we intercept and uh, we basically check uh, and uh, take a look at the binary executable and at the runtime process and see, okay, um, has the runtime process been corrupted in any way? Is it uh, not behaving according to the binary on the disk? And uh, if that's okay, we will just let the uh, operating system call proceed. If not, uh, we terminate the program. What kind of information do we uh, extract from the runtime uh, state or what do we basically need? Uh, what we have here is like the typical uh, state of a process run, uh, of a process at the time of a system call. So you have the program that first performs a function call into uh, a library, say libc, where you usually have some, uh, uh, a system call wrapper. And uh, the system call wrapper then actually performs the actual system call into the kernel where the system call is being taken off, uh, care of by the system call handler. So uh, the information that we have uh, at the system call invocation is first uh, the return address, which points back into the library. And uh, what we also have is uh, the system call number, so we know, of course, which system call has been invoked. And we do have the system call arguments. So basically, okay, uh, say write, okay, which file descriptor do we write to? And uh, then what we have as well on risk is the link address. A link address is pretty nice because uh, it's the register containing the return address of the last function invocation, which will then point back into the program. And uh, on MIPS, there is actually even um, one additional um, register that we can take, uh, that we can use because the ABI on MIPS specifies that you usually use an extra register to perform indirect jumps, so we have the target for this one as well. Okay, uh, given all that information, um, we now need to inspect the binary, right? So we need to take a look at the binary on the disk. And uh, here we have um, a function. Um, we have a function prolog, this, say this is the assembly code that is stored on the disk, um, where we reserve some stack space. We have uh, the argument assignment. Here we can see the arguments which are being loaded into the argument registers. This is also pretty risk standard. So you pass the uh, arguments to a function invocation via registers. Uh, and then we have a function call here via the T9 register, which is the standard register to perform an indirect function call over. And, um, and uh, yes, and the, the final, the mop instruction is basically where the link address points back into. So now, uh, from, this, uh, from, this, from this link address offset in the binary, so this is, the, this is basically the code that's been stored on the disk, right, because we want to get our ground truth. We start to disassemble backwards, and uh, we do that either until the function beginning or until we hit some control flow diversion. And um, the, uh, when we stop disassembling backwards, we start uh, to execute that code snippet basically forward. And then uh, we try, uh, we, we basically, we extract all the invariants, which are the concrete values at the end of the execution. So in this case, we would know, for example, uh, after we, this execution emulation, that uh, in the argument register, A0, we have, uh, the, there needs to be a seven, right? And yeah, as I said, so this is static analysis uh, that we perform on the binary executable on the disk and not on the memory contents. Okay, how uh, can we use this to actually enforce uh, this binary integrity? So there's uh, three, three basic pillars, let's put it that way. The first of them is code provenance. So uh, we check basically where do the function invocations uh, originate from and we only allow legit locations. So uh, say uh, if we have, uh, a function invocation that comes from the stack or data segment or something, then we 
then this is, uh, of course, not legit. Then we have uh, code integrity, where we check whether the call chain is reflected by the binary itself, and whether the system call arguments that we can see match the invariants that we have extracted before from the binary on the disk. And the third thing that we do uh, is symbol integrity. Here we check whether the system call wrappers that are, uh, or the system call wrapper that has been used, whether it has actually been imported by the native code program that has been executed. So uh, to enforce this code provenance, which uh, is like our, basically let's, yeah, that's the, that's the super data execution prevention that we do. That's why I don't really like the word data execution prevention because we do more a little bit. So we first uh, construct our trusted application code base and uh, this trusted application code base basically contains all the valid code regions of the process runtime image. So uh, these are the map text segments of the running process itself and it also includes the text segments of libraries of course and it's been fixated after linking stage. So anything, yeah, that's uh, outside the, this trusted application code base is actually invalid. So both the return addresses, uh, the return address of the system call and the link address need to point into those code regions. Um, so uh, for enforcing code integrity, again, I have two assembly snip snippets. Uh, yeah, as you can see, this talks a little bit more <laughs> uh, down to the guts. Um, and uh, so what we can check here, so on the left hand side we have, the, we have the, 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 the program code basically that has been executed by the program. You can see that MF should be called here uh, in the libc for example. And on the right hand side we have the system call wrapper which actually then will execute the system, this MF system code. So uh, knowing uh, the return address, we can check whether the predecessor of the return address actually is a system call. So the return address will point to the MOP instruction on the, on the, on the right-hand side. And uh, so this is the first thing that we can verify, okay, is the code actually there? And then the next thing that we can check is, uh, has the right system call been invoked? Because the system call number, of course, is, is usually being assigned uh, right above the system call invocation. Then uh, the next thing that we can do is uh, check the link address and we can check whether the predecessor of the link address is really like uh, similar to the system call case, is actually uh, really uh, a jump address. Uh, the, the, the address where there's an instruction that issues a jump. And whether the target of the branch actually matches the callee, so whether the right system call wrap has actually been invoked. And um, what we can also check is whether the actual system call arguments match the invariants that we have extracted before. For symbol integrity, so uh, if you think of just a normal program that uses MMAP, then uh, the symbol MMAP has to be, on the one hand, exported by the library, which would be libc usually, and it has to be imported by the program, right? So it has to be in the import table of the actual program. And uh, with symbol integrity, um, what we basically do is we check that uh, the symbol of the function that we have identified by the return address so in libc, okay, we can see that mmap is being used, so, uh, uh, and mmap is associated with the mmap export. We check that it also has been imported by the binary that has been identified by the link address. So if the binary, for example, say system is being used, and system has never been uh, imported by the binary to begin with, by the program, then uh, this is also clearly not uh, a valid invocation. So um, which kind of uh, attacks can we mitigate with, this, uh, with these techniques? So first of all, there's uh, basic code in uh, injection attacks. So say I want to inject code into the data segment, then the defense would be code provenance because it's in a data segment uh, and there's the, the, the uh, say, I don't know, I put something in the heap uh, and it's not actually in the binary on the disk. Yeah, we have code provenance that will prevent this from happening. If uh, I decide, ah, okay, so uh, say the heap is being pr protected, so I try to overwrite the text segment. Say I mark the text segment uh, writable. Um, then again, uh, we have code integrity because the instructions will actually mismatch with the binary on the disk. Um, for code reuse attacks, it's getting a little bit more complicated. See, there's an indirect jump gadget being used. Then uh, we will see that the target of the branch actually doesn't uh, uh, does not match, 
or uh, another way would be that the symbol integrity doesn't, uh, uh, yeah, symbol integrity basically fires. So um, that, for example, say system has not been imported. And um, if you use uh, return-oriented programming, so code reuse attack again, and you actually use a gadget that calls a library function instead directly without going through an indirect jump gadget, um, then we can still uh, check if we, if we have static arguments, whether those arguments match. So whether the runtime arguments actually match from uh, the arguments that we have extracted from the binary running on the disk. Um, I've also, since this is, uh, yeah, since we just had this table before, I've got some, some concrete examples. So what we have here is uh, such an indirect jump gadget, uh, as I said before. So you usually um, write it PLT, this address is being loaded into T9, and then uh, the argument is being loaded into A0, and then we have the indirect jump via T9. So uh, in this case, if we, if an attacker would uh, abuse this by by putting something else in T9 and then just jump, uh, and then just going directly to this uh, indirect jump, then uh, yeah, T9 would not match the invariant, and we would basically uh, detect that. Um, here we have a different. Here we have a fixed jump gadget. This is uh, that uh, that, uh, that directly branches to to write, so to the write system core wrapper. And uh, it, uh, as we can see here, it statically sets the argument zero to one, which basically corresponds to standard out. So, for example, this gadget could not be re, uh, reused to write to a to a different uh, file descriptor. Uh, Here is a similar case actually with MMAP that happens actually quite often. So um, in this case we have, for example, here that, uh, that MMAP is originally being called with an argument uh, to make the, the past memory region just uh, read an executable, which is the value 5. And again, if an attacker would say modify this here and uh, to to load, uh, to load seven, which would correspond to read write executable writes into the argument register and try to overwrite this, uh, we would again uh, see that we got an argument mismatch here. And um, this is actually the case that I mentioned before. So uh, say I've, I've got an indirect jump gadget that does not have any restrictions, so the last thing that, uh, that, still, um, that, that can still kick in here is uh, that if T9 has been replaced by uh, the address of the of the system uh, of the system uh, function in libc, um, but system is not used by the program itself, so it's not in the import table, then uh, we would again see see okay it has not been imported by the imported by the program, so we terminate it. And um, yeah, if you take a look at the typical ROP stager for return-oriented programming, uh, which is a basically a combination of normal return-oriented programming and traditional shell code uh, that first uses return-oriented programming to mark an executable memory region, uh, mark a memory region executable, sorry, and basically put more payload in there. Um, and uh, then on MIPS, would also need to flush the cache to basically manifest that in the memory. Then here, the code reuse mitigation would kick in. And at the same time, uh, when it starts to try to execute the traditional shell code, the payload, in this memory region, we would have the code injection mitigation. So, um, yeah, we implemented this whole system uh, as a kernel module, uh, the integrity kernel module for Linux, and um, which basically consists of a couple of parts. So it interacts with both the process to extract the runtime information and with the binaries on the disk. Then we have the emulation engine, which uh, consists of an ELF parser because we need to, to parse, uh, parse the binaries on the disk. And actually, that also works with strip binaries, so this is not a problem. It has a di disassembler and a complete code emulator in it uh, that we implemented for both ARM and the MIPS um, architecture. And uh, we also have uh, an invariant cache, which I will come back to later because these are quite costly operations, all this disassembling and emulation, so we also cache some information. Um, 
our implementation supports different checking levels because not all functions are critical the same way. And uh, so we can reduce checking to increase performance in uh, some ways. So this is an option that, we, uh, that this module supports. So we have uh, basically level one checks that check, just check for code provenance. We have level two checks that include on top of that uh, code integrity. And we have level three checks that on top of that include symbol integrity as well. So basically the full program. And um, yeah, so in Linux we identified 33 security critical system calls. And uh, this we, we instrument basically 11 at checking level two and 22 at checking level three. The reason for this is also that uh, so, uh, some functions are just used by every program. So uh, checking them to, for example, for symbol integrity does not, uh, does not uh, provide any additional security benefit. For example, if you, uh, yeah, write will probably be used by almost every program. So it, uh, we just check for code integrity here. Um, yeah, of course we also did a performance evaluation. We added something to the kernel, right? So uh, the scatter piece on overhead. And uh, what we did is uh, we used a Buffalo router that uh, runs, uh, 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 runs Linux, so open BRT. And we used Apache Benchmark and Nginx and we got an approximate runtime overhead of 2% uh, on this stuff. And we also evaluated it on a Galaxy Nexus phone uh, with just running uh, stock uh, Android, although I don't re remember the exact Android version that we ran. Uh, we used the N22 benchmark because it was the best that we could find and uh, measured the Android runtime and the I.O. subsystem. And here we had an even lower runtime overhead. Um, we also did an internal performance evaluation. As I said before, we have quite costly operations that are involved. We uh, read and parse files that are stored on the disk uh, on a system call invocation. So that usually uh, takes lots of time. We also have this uh, instruction emulation. Um, and we also have a certain memory footprint. Uh, so we have the kernel module code, which is not that big. Uh, and we also have uh, the invariant cache. The invariant cache actually stores these invariants, so this, uh, the data that we extract from the binaries for around 257 code points. So uh, this roughly requires a total of 12 uh, kilobytes per process. Uh, so again, it's not that much. Um, this uh, graph actually shows how much caching, uh, how vital caching is to the whole thing. So uh, basically the, the, the red bars shows how much the overhead would be, and this is on a log scale, if we would not have caching, but as soon as, uh, so as, soon as the caching for the code points kicks in, uh, our overhead is significantly lower. So whenever we have a cache hit, it's actually, uh, yeah, it's not that bad. And uh, here we have, uh, yeah, so what we did here is uh, we had the web server running on the, on the router and we, we browsed that web, uh, web page on that uh, router web server with uh, a browser running on Android on ARM. And what we can see here nicely is that at program startup, we have lots of invariant extractions. So there's, of course, uh, um, lots of system calls have been done at program startup. Then uh, caching kicks in and we are, we are basically idling regarding to invariant extractions. And only as soon as we actually surf to the website and open it up, uh, we have again a peak, and then uh, any subsequent accesses basically don't exercise uh, super new code paths, so it uh, kind of levels out over the time. Okay, uh, coming to uh, conclusions. So uh, what we did is uh, we used architectural features of risk that are basically intrinsic to risk and that are fairly generic uh, to the improve the security of embedded devices. and. Uh, we provide addition, so this is of additional benefit for platforms without hardware security. Um, this will not be of uh, super, super additional benefit for, I don't know, uh, top of the line Android phones that already run Android, the, the, the newest version, but will definitely uh, benefit lower and budget uh, devices. And we provide uh, dep like functionality for those devices. We have uh, lightweight CFI for binary only in applications, so we don't require source code. And uh, yeah, system call filter 
policy extraction method from the actual binary image, so you don't need to write extra policies for this. And it also has a uh, pretty low overhead and is transparent to applications. Uh, this is also not research vaporware, this stuff actually exists, and if you're interested, you can also have a look at the source code here. So, yep. Thank you for the talk. Oh, <laughs> attention. Thanks for that. Any questions right now? So my question is, you say that your solution is different from previous works because you don't need kind of policy, you can just look into the binary. Uh, so my question is why you think it is much different because uh, to resolve possible targets, you have to analyze control flow graph of the application and maybe previous works, they just extracted the policy and then stored it somewhere. You don't store it, you just do it on the fly. Why conceptually do you think it is different? Uh, well, so one thing that I think is different uh, is that you, uh, is, is that we, that basically everything happens at runtime, so it's transparent. There's no policy that a user has to take care of or anything uh, being involved. Uh, usually these solutions would not involve the user, they would just analyze the binary, they would make a policy in automated way and then enforce it at runtime. What you are doing, you do the same, but just you don't store it, you just apply it immediately. And I doubt that you can really extract very precise policies because actually uh, uh, static analysis cannot resolve the targets uh, very precisely, so your policy would be uh, loose, this is my guess. Uh, yeah, so this is also a pretty lightweight solution, right? We do this at runtime and we do the, the system call invocation. And mm -hmm. we also, we, we don't ex extract a whole CFG of the, of the program, we don't do that. So really, what we just do is at runtime, when the system call happens, we peek back into the, into the binary and we look what kind of code is there and what does this code do. So there's no uh, complete CFG generation involved. We just take a look at those two code points. It's really targeted at, uh, yeah, at, at, the very, uh, at the very low level right before the system call invocation. So you would probably be able to prohibit some for sure malicious uh, transfers, but you don't know, so you still allow uh, code transfers, uh, many targets, and uh, you cannot be sure if the one which happens currently is the correct one. I'm not sure I understand uh, it entirely. So, but no, it's it's not a pure CFI solution that will that will that will enforce the whole path up to the system call. Yeah, I mean, because uh, can you ensure that uh, by verifying the binary, you can resolve the exact target? So. Uh, by static analysis of your binary, can you be sure that... No, uh, you can, I mean, you can never be sure, just using static analysis. That's what my point is, so yes. you can never be sure, and it doesn't matter if you do lightweight... No, it's, it's also not a, it's not a prevention mechanism, it's a mitigation. Okay. It's, uh, it can, it, w it will not help against all attacks, and uh, if you have a very, very super determined attacker, he will for sure find a way of crafting a path that, uh, that will will try to bypass it. Okay, thank but, you. But uh, it's, mm -hmm. it's definitely, I mean, it's with many security solutions, it's, it's one, it's another way of raising the bar, right? Okay, thank you. So, first of all, <clears throat> I think this is a very interesting solution. Um, maybe I just got lost in the details, but um, exploits love to uh, execute uh, functions like system and what about the target application actually uh, uses system so the import is legit and the arguments are not invariant. Is, uh, can your solution mitigate the risk? So uh, that completely depends on how system is invoked and how it is being used, right? So if a system is always being used with a string constant that is stored in the binary, then Yes, because we have the string constant in the binary. If 
if I write native code that invokes system with a dynamically generated string, um, I'm not sure it's, it's like super, super security uh, sensitive coding. And then, yeah. I mean, it's, it's in some way, of course, limited to what the application gives you. Everything that we can enforce depends on, on how it has been written originally. Okay, I'm afraid <laughs> most uh, calls to system uh, actually do like construct the, the argument dynamically. <laughs> Thank you. Hi. Uh, you mentioned that you're uh, actually comparing the binary that loaded into the kernel uh, against the binary allocated on the file system. Am I, am I correct? We, uh, I'm, uh, we are comparing the, the, the runtime process image in memory against the binary that is stored on the disk. Okay. So yeah, actually in, uh, in Android, in Java application, the, re the, the binary on the on the disk is in the DEX format or something uh, that uh, the Dalvik is actually uh, jitting and you, and you receive something totally different format w from what uh, located on the disk. Am I right? Mm, yes, so this uh, also this applies to, to native code level. It does not apply to, to, to Java or JIT code. I mean, we are compatible with JIT yeah. uh, because basically what we do is we, we, we wet the JIT layer, right? Yeah. Uh, but uh, but not not the the Java code that has been executed. Okay, thank you. Yes, hi. So first of all, uh, good job. I really like the really like the work. Uh, but I was wondering whether you could also port this uh, towards the x86 platform. So as you mentioned, uh, there are already solutions there, but they don't focus on ARM. But do you think that your solution So porting it to x86, is that, did sure. I understand it correctly? Yeah, so whether or not you can, you can port Bintegrity, Bintegrity to uh, the x86 okay. platform. So um, the certain difficulties involved on x86 because, um, for example, we use heavily backwards disassembly, which is easy on RISC because we have fixed instructions at length. Uh, on CISC, this is, I mean, yeah, you never really know what you're going to back, backwards disassemble, right? So this would definitely be one of the struggles. And then uh, what we also, do, so we, we rely heavily on the, on the register-based architecture. So basically that passes arguments in registers, usually tries not to modify them in a certain way, and so on, uh, which you don't have to this extent on x86. I mean, I know on, on x, uh, on 64-bit on that usually the calling convention is to pass already the arguments in registers, but um, yes, that would only target then 64-bit. Thank you. Any other questions at the moment? It falls to me to have a tough one again. Did you try it with a specific exploit? Uh, did we try it with a specific exploit? Um, so uh, the problem is no, we did not, which, <laughs> which does sound bad at the beginning, right? But uh, we took a look at, at uh, various exploits, but they are very hard to, to recreate because you need, for example, we, we looked at, at router exploits, uh, but you need to have the exact same router model running the exact same software on that router, and we really we struggled to 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 get uh, to get the whole setup basically running because some of the router models are not available anymore. Then you need to go to eBay, and uh, I really I thought, okay, I, I can spend the time better than doing this. But we looked at the actual exploits and how they how they work, and yes, uh, actually. I mean, there's a paper on the submission to an academic conference that lists several exploits which would have been mitigated using this. How technique. many of them would still go through? Uh, how many of them would still go through that would, uh, I don't have exact numbers in my head, so, yeah. Then, thanks again, thanks a lot. <laughs>